Hi everyone, it's Amin here and today I'm doing a highly, highly requested video. I'm going to be talking about the application process for genetic counseling schools. So if you are interested in knowing what genetic counseling is or you just heard it for the first time, make sure to check out my first video all about genetic counseling. I'll link it up here. So over on my Instagram, I asked my followers to submit some questions about the application process for genetic counseling so that I could answer them here for you. And I want to start off by saying that all of these opinions are based off my personal experience and I applied in 2018 for the 2019 cycle. So I'm currently in my second year of a genetic counseling program and things honestly do change from year to year. So this is just my experience. Please do your own research and make sure that you have all the prerequisites and and you're following all of the guidelines from the schools that you're interested in. So just to get started, a general overview of some of the requirements or the prerequisites you need from genetic counseling programs are specific courses that are in genetics, psychology, biochemistry, statistics, and that can vary from school to school. The thing with genetic counseling is that there's no one application website or one application process or form you have to submit. Each school has their own requirements on what you need to apply there, what you need as prerequisites. So it can be really overwhelming to get a sense of what you need to have done in order to be a competitive applicant. So besides the courses, schools will often recommend that you have some kind of advocacy experience, some kind of exposure to genetic counseling. So a shadowing experience would obviously be the best working as a genetic counseling assistant or even having informational interviews. On top of all of that, you are required to submit a personal statement or a personal essay. Some schools will have specific guidelines on what they want you to talk about. Others will have more of a general idea of what they would like to hear from you. But like I said, every school is extremely different. So make sure to check in on the websites of the schools that you're interested in. Additionally, the schools will require you to submit letter of references. This also varies depending on school to school. And lastly, according to my knowledge, the GRE is not required for most programs anymore. When I had to apply, I did have to write the GRE. If you're applying in this cycle, make sure that you're on top of it and on top of checking what each school needs for you to even be considered as an applicant because my experience is kind of outdated at this point. One of the questions I got on my Instagram was what is a competitive GPA for you to apply? Like everything else, this also varies from school to school. Some have a higher cutoff and some are more lenient. I would say even to be considered the lowest you should be is about a 3.0 would be helpful for you to have a higher GPA, but if you don't, you can still try to explain and try to do other things outside of school to kind of make up for that. I struggled a lot in my first couple of years in my undergrad, but over time I showed a lot of growth and I had like an upwards trend, which can be a good thing to see as well, as long as you can justify the reasons for your grades and what you learned from it. A common question I got was about the interview process. So once you have applied to these schools, they actually want you to do an interview with them. So it's a very long, stressful and overwhelming experience. It takes a lot of time to even go through the prospect of being an applicant for a genetic counseling school. So in my time, pre-COVID times, we had to come in person for interviews, which has pros and cons to it. Of course, because of COVID, a lot of the programs had to switch to doing um, virtual interviews or online interviews this last round. And I suspect that in the future, it will be similar to that as well or they'll be more lenient towards people doing more online virtual interviews. I won't say how many interviews I had just because it's my personal experience and I don't want anyone to compare themselves to me or think they're doing a lot better or a lot worse because honestly everything is very personalized so I know people who only had one interview and they got in. I know people that had multiple interviews and didn't get in so it, it honestly is just very, very personal to your own situation. But in terms of what the interviews look like from my experience, the questions that you get asked are pretty basic questions for the most part. Some schools do make you do 
um, teamwork building exercises or they want you to do MMI style interviews. Um, some are very relaxed, some are extremely long, like they last 10 hours, like it all just really, really varies. If you do get invited to an interview, congratulations, that's a huge step, um, but obviously it doesn't end there. What happens in the interview can also be a really big factor if you are going to be accepted into the program or if you even want to go to that program, if I'm being honest. So when I was brainstorming questions to practice for my interview, I did a lot of research and if there's one thing you're going to take away from this video, it is to do your research. Make sure you know about that program, what that program values, what kind of courses you're taking, what faculty you're going to be working with. Um, anything you can get off of the internet or talking to people, make sure you're prepared for your interview. And then on top of that, just think about general questions that you might be asked. Of course, you should be able to answer, why do you want to be a genetic counselor? Why do you want to come into this program? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Something that I think was common in my experience was being asked, um, tell me about a situation when, or tell me about a time when, and then they would give different scenarios such as a time you were overwhelmed or a time when you had to tell someone bad news, like things like that. And honestly, there's no right answer. There's no bank of questions. It all just depends on the program that you're interviewing at. And it's everything just seems very vague, but I just practiced a lot with my friends <laughs> and I made them do mock interviews with me all the time, just so I had a good sense of how to answer questions and then just felt more confident going in. Some tips I would say for your interviews, like this is so cliche, everyone says it, but to be yourself, like don't pretend like you're someone you're not because you will be spending the next two years with these people and you wanna make sure that you are a good fit for them, that you are a good fit for the program. Like I said, do your research, make sure you know what you're talking about, um, make sure you're asking questions. Most interviewers will ask you what questions you have or do you have any questions for me? And you always, always, always need to have questions for them because if you don't it'll seem like you're not interested and you did not do your research so ask some questions that are genuinely questions that you want the answers to so for me personally i really wanted to know if there was time for me to have a part-time job so i literally asked some logistical questions how much free time do students have? Is it common for them to have a part-time job? It's, it sounds very basic, but it shows them that you're actually interested and you can see yourself going to this program. So I would recommend to have your own questions ready to go. Do practice, um, ask your parents, ask your friends, ask other members in your family to practice mock questions with you after you've done enough brainstorming, after you've done enough research to think about what kinds of questions would be most likely to pop up during an interview. And lastly, my advice is to trust your gut. Um, it might be a little bit difficult when you're doing virtual interviews to kind of get the vibe or the feeling of the program and the campus, but if you feel like something is off, you're probably right. It probably is not the right fit for you, or if you feel really, really excited after an interview and you can really see yourself there, that would be something that I would say to trust your gut on as well. So after all the interviews are done, it is a long process. Schools do not send out interviews at the same time. They do not give interview dates at the same time. You can sometimes have to miss school, sometimes have to miss work. Like it's a lot of juggling to go on at the same time. So once you're done all your interviews, you have to go through the match process. So I don't want to speak too much about the match because um, I will link down below in the description the actual website so you can go out and check it yourself. But basically what happens is after you're done all your interviews, you're going to rank the places that you interviewed at and then the programs will rank their interviewees. On one day, usually at the end of April, they're going to release who has been matched to what program. So you'll get an email and it'll say, congratulations, you have matched or unfortunately you did not match to a program. Match can sometimes be complicated. It can be very nuanced. So like I said, I don't want to go to much into it um, but if you are interested definitely check out the website below um, and ask the match people if they have any questions ask the programs if you have any questions about that as well but it's nice that you get to know if you have been accepted or not all on the same day so you know at the end of April where you're going to be heading either virtually or physically for the next school year and another question I got was how to stay sane and how to be organized during this whole process. Like I said, it's very overwhelming to make sure that you have all the prerequisites for the schools that you're interested in, apply to the schools, get interviews or not get interviews, and then pick an interview date, and then do the interview, and then do the ranking for the match. So 
it's a lot, I get it, I've been there. Um, and if you are feeling overwhelmed just by hearing all of this, a lot of people do take time between undergrad and grad school to make sure they have the prerequisites, they have the experience. Um, sometimes people apply multiple times to make sure they get in. Sometimes people apply on their first time and they get in. It all really, really varies. But the way that I organized myself was I found out about halfway through my undergrad that this is something that I wanted to pursue. So what I did was I looked at many programs, looked at the general prerequisites, and then tried to organize my rest of my degree to make sure I was fitting those prerequisites, including the volunteer work, including the shadowing, the GRE, everything like that. And then when I was ready to start applying, I made an Excel sheet, like tables and Excel sheets will be your friend. It takes months of organizing to even prepare, but that's just me. I love being organized, I love planning, but I do know people who just don't do well with that because it stresses them out. So of course, everything will be individualized. I made an Excel sheet that had all of the programs that I was interested in applying to, and then the application deadlines, the prerequisites, the application fees, and what they needed in terms of letters of recommendation. And then I basically made a skeleton version of that with just the deadline for all of my writers for my letters of recommendation so that they could have it. So it was a very long and gruesome process. And then as I got rejections or as I got an interview invitations, I updated that Excel sheet as well. So at the end of it, when I was finally done my interviews and I ranked my schools, I ranked my schools based on factors that were important to me. So some of those things for me that were important to consider were obviously tuitions, grad school is very expensive, the cost of living in terms of having an apartment or on-campus housing or um, how much it costs to do grocery shopping, what the location was, how far was it from home, how would I be able to go home and visit, how many students were in my class, was I going to be in a large class, what their classes look like, what their courses look like, how many rotations would I have, how long their rotations would be. So there were a lot of factors that I considered and there are probably more that you can consider for yourself that you find important but like I said everything is extremely extremely personalized and I don't mean to overwhelm you but it is a wake-up call that it's a very long process and you need to be able to start thinking about it early on because it will take a lot of time and effort to make sure that you are a competitive applicant before you even start applying. So those are all the questions that I had on my Instagram about the application process. And just my last piece of advice would be that if you are contacting genetic counselors or genetic counseling students asking about their experiences or you want to know more, I would highly recommend that you ask questions that you have done your research on already and that you want to know their opinion on or you want to know their specific experience. So what I mean by that is when you are reaching out to someone, don't ask them questions like, oh, how many students actually get accepted into a program? You can Google that and find that yourself. And I don't mean to be rude. It's just you need to be self-sufficient and you need to be motivated. And that's a really big part of genetic counseling as a field and especially the program. So you can find that on the Match website. They have um, data that they release every year, how many people were offered interviews, how many people ended up matching, all of that is online. So if there's something that you can find the answer to online, I would recommend that you do that first and then come up with a set of questions that you are actually genuinely interested in finding out that you couldn't find out online that is based on this person's personal experience and then ask them those questions. So that's just a recommendation for anyone you're reaching out to when you're talking to any program faculty, when you're talking to any specific genetic counselors, like having informational interviews or you're reaching out to students that go to a program you're interested in, any of that, I would highly recommend that you take a well thought out approach to that as well. So that was everything I had for this video. I really hope that it was helpful for you. Genetic counseling is a great profession. I'm super excited to be joining the field and joining the workforce in a very few short months, um, which is kind of nerve wracking but you know what I feel like I've been preparing for this for many years and I'm really excited and if you have any questions for me obviously I have been replying to a lot of dms on instagram so if you have good questions that you've researched well and you want to know my experiences or you have questions about anything else feel free to dm me I have been replying to people but also make sure that you are using the resources that I am linking down below or doing your own research as well. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. If you wanna see more about my experiences as a genetic counseling student, you can subscribe to my channel and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.